if, for instance, artistic snobbery is something that you sort of regale against completely, what about the fact that you produced an album for Supermodel, and I will say that because that's how she's perceived, Naomi Campbell. Um, and some people would sort of balk at that and say, what on earth is he up to doing yeah. something like that? And like, do you say, well, I'm actually doing an album for somebody who I think is a very good voice. It's as simple as that. It's like, go away. It's, 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 it's not as simple as that, but nearly as simple as that. Um, Naomi asked uh, myself and Morris to write some songs for her. Uh, we were working with Tim on the name of the father stuff, and she says, oh, would you do a song for me? Uh, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we were mates. We, we, had, we had a good vibe with the girl, and uh, we knew her. And uh, I says, but I don't know if you can sing now. And she got up and sang. And I went, this girl can sing. Uh, we did three tunes. Everyone said that uh, we produced it. Youth did three tunes. Somebody else did three tunes. PM Dawn. And to tell the truth, being totally honest, I remember halfway through our session, I says, you're going to make a mistake if you don't grab it by the balls and just concentrate on making a record. Because uh, you can't make films and make records and be supermodel and be whatever. Uh, you can try, but if you're going to be an actor, you've got to put all your life into that, whatever. And uh, we sort of backed off from doing the whole album then, and we did the three tunes. I'm really happy with the three tunes. I'm not happy with the horrible remix they did, which sounds like some Kylie Minogue thing. Right. But uh, I loved also the challenge of, uh, you know, in the 90s, what supermodels became. They were like, everyone was obsessed with them. Yeah. You, know, you know, the housewife to the bloke, the lad down the pub were obsessed with them. And they became almost like these new pop stars. I mean, the song on uh, Shag Tobacco is in a roundabout way about Naomi, Little Black Dress. Right. And, uh, I just find it like, there's no way, when that woman walks in the room, it's like the Red Sea opens, man. No matter who you are, whether you're a man or a woman, you go, whoa. The power of a woman. Totally. Gavin, in the three years between the second solo album and the current one, in other words, Adam and Eve and Shag Tobacco, if Tim Simmons' ignorance, if you like, of your influences was something that you gave a wry laugh to and actually liked the whole idea of, to bring sort of a new influence to the album, was there something else as well, and that is, your extracurricular activities, if you like. For instance, like one of those was uh, working on In the Name of the Father, and not just working on In the Name of the Father in terms of the soundtrack, but actually being in charge of the whole thing. Because you were very, like, there was Sinead O'Connor, there was Bono, but you were the guy in charge. Was that sort of a daunting experience, but a really, really good one at the end of the day? It was a bit of like Jim, who I know, you know, 15, 16 years from the late 70s, in the Project Art Centre, he gave us one of our first gigs as the Virgin Prunes. And Jim was making the movie, and I met him in a pub, and he was going, I'm demented with Irish musicians. I'm talking about a movie about 70s Ireland. It's anger, it's frustration, you know, it's not a happy movie. You know, it's a pretty heavy movie. Uh, but everyone's coming up with these, oh, Giuseppe is dying in the prison songs, mm -hmm. and the fiddle's coming out, and he says, I want this to be like a kick in the balls movie, uh, but I don't want it to be negative, I want it to be positive. So he brought me in, basically, because he knew I'm allergic to the last diddly eye syndrome, right? So he brought me in as musical consultant, and at the same time, Jim Sheridan had 50 people writing the songs. He chained me down, he wanted you too, he wanted us. And, and what was happening was like, you know, you two were in the middle of the rope or something, and uh, they couldn't do it, but Bono wanted to do something. We had started writing stuff, myself and Morris, and uh, Bono says, hey, let me egg in on this one, and we start writing together. And I basically was also, when I went over to America with Jim, I was like a musical consultant, and that was basically like, let's put Jimi Hendrix into a riot scene. It was that type of yeah, attitude, you. because... When you're 17, you're not really political. Yeah. You're thinking of rock and roll and sex, and that's that's what we were trying to get at. Uh, it gave. I was. I loved it, you know, because I liked being a thorn in the side. I loved going over to uh, L.A. with Jim, and Jim is like, you know, he's like a contemporary Brendan Dean. How are you? Do you think it's a good movie? Do you? And he knows well of it. You know what I mean? But he plays a little leprechaun, but he's a Svengali. He's a genius. And the uh, LA Hollywood people idolize him because they're afraid of him. They says, what's this? You know? And we were just causing trouble. And he was there pushing me on to say, make sure they don't make it soppy. Yeah. So I was being uh, 
but it did give me incredible confidence. And what it did give us was uh, myself and Morris was an insight into how score is done. Right, this you is know, uh, Trevor Jones has done. You know, what is it like? More is less. More is less, and arrangement and articulate. It's it's really the you know boring. It's hours and hours, and we're like sitting in there, we're like back seats passengers as well, and we just learned so much. I think it, it sort of we jumped ten folds as a as sort of writers yeah. from just that discipline. But like that was like six months work, yeah, uh, on and then the father. And I think from then on, how we approached, I mean, it became far more uh, solidified for us as musicians, you know. Okay, well it's approaching almost like it's certainly more than 25, almost 30 years your friendship with Bono. Now you've said that he's saved your life and that you've saved his. In what respect? I mean, is it just that you're always there for each other or is it specific? That sounds very dramatic. Yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> 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 I say that I know. It just saved his life. Um, I think it's because of friends, you know. I know since I'm a kid. And um, you can go up your arse very quickly in this business. And it's very... Uh, scary out there sometimes when you're touring and and it's that sort of like pulling you back down and say get it together man and then just having somebody that's on the same level that knows what it's like to make a record and go out and tour and and, and then just to be mates and would you ever want the madness i mean would you ever want that height of fame that he's got and the world on his shoulders and like even going out and tour and just say 400 people working with the whole thing and if he gets a cold they're out of a gig uh, no i don't envy the man um, but I think it's in you uh, from day one. Yeah. Uh, these guys at 17 have already, they're, you're built like that to go that way. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's in your psyche, it's in your bones, as they say. Do you know what I mean? And are you surprised and delighted that he's kept together? really has kept together, hasn't Yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah. It, it's complicated. I mean, we're almost like two brothers, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, and the weird thing was that when you sort of like leave home when you're 17 and you form bands together and you go out there, our family is our music yeah. and, and we're two brothers. Right. So, and that sounds soppy as well, you know yeah, what I mean? But, yeah. but that's the vibe really. Uh, and, and we look after each other's ass, you know what I mean? Okay, what is next? I mean, are you going to do this spoken word verse poetry album with Pat McKay? Does that what's coming up? Yeah, we're, we're, we're nearly finished recording that at the moment. When you say spoken word, I immediately think, hold on, what's this? Bore the bollocks for 45 minutes. Because like, it's, it's a hard thing to listen to someone speak. Uh, you know what I mean? Our attention spans are like this now. Mm. So uh, we're, I wouldn't call it a spoken word thing. It's almost like, it's, it's, it's like music, you know? There's music behind it. It's almost like a 45 minute movie without any visuals. It's, uh, we're working with uh, Howie B and Tim Stone and all yeah. that. So, so it's almost like a spoken word come chill out, come remix, come whatever. I don't know what it is, but I think it's finished. Okay, well in your work down through the years then, finally Gavin, if, if there is such a thing as a sort of a central motif, just let's say there's a few of them, could I say sexual ambiguity has been part of just about everything you've done, like the androgyny of David Bowie was one of the first things that must have attracted you to. Okay. You said earlier, like, I mean, like, who is that? What you really meant to say was, what is that, almost? Right. Yeah. Okay, is this a constant thing with you, the feminine side, all this kind of thing? Like, it's been there since the beginning, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. it's still there. Is this important to you? Is there a new man thing there? That's a lot of questions. It is a lot of questions. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, in a weird way, Shag Tobacco is uh, almost like put it to bed for me. Uh, no, right. Uh, now I could contradict myself in six months and God knows what I'll write, you know mm. what I mean? Uh, but um, the Virgin Prunes were very inarticulate. Uh, they were very articulate emotionally and visually, but really inarticulate. If you listen to all the albums or singles, you go, I still don't know what he was on about. Mm. Uh, and in a weird way, you know, I, I was sort of like only beginning to be mature when I was in my 20s, yeah. when I did each man and stuff like that. So really I'm sort of like cleaning up sewing up all areas I dabbled in. Uh, but to, the main point is that it's something that I was always, something that I'm not afraid of is my feminine side. Uh, coming from uh, the background of like what, what the Virgin Prunes, what the Virgin Prunes were doing when they were wearing a dress was okay, clothes are really important to anyone when you're a teenager, even when you're older. But what was really with going, don't categorize me. 
He called me a poof. And I hadn't even got it together in my head. Why? Do you know what I mean? It was like, don't you tell us what we are. And we sat from Googie like we're taking a board almost like as a, as a flag. Like, you think that you, you, but the way the Venture Twins dressed was never like, you know, gender bender. It was never like Bon George. You didn't know if I was going to kiss you or beat you up. Mm. It was, you know what I mean? It was never a, like ever so fay. And the other version of Brunscape was more like an exorcism than a, a camp party. And it's a cliche, oh, sexual. You know what I mean? Yeah. But the truth is, we are. That's why his time's going on. Yeah, it's true. We're sexual, and that's what we are. And Shag Tobacco is almost like an A to Z of that. It's going through sort of husband and wife, uh, transvestites, you know, drag queen. Demented housewife, tormented lovers, happy lovers. It's, it's just almost like little photocopies, yeah. little little snapshots of all different scenarios yeah. of sexuality. Um, uh, it is one thing that sort of like turns us all off. Do you know what I mean? <laughs>